Hello. Um, like everybody else, I'd like to thank Molly for organizing this because it's been great. Um, and um, I'm really only going to talk about half of my ambitious title, but if anybody wants to talk to me about the other half later, I'm happy to. Um, so mostly I want to talk about these things, which I'm calling, well, and other people call uh, genomic landscapes in particular. Um, <clears throat> So what I'm showing you here in the sort of bluish gray curve is genetic diversity along the two arms of the third chromosome, a Drosophila melanogaster. And the thing we noticed from this figure is that like, it changes a lot as you look on a chromosomal scale. It has this big hill. And, and furthermore, um, it's correlated with the green line, which is recombination rate, and not the pink line, which is uh, divergence to Drosophila simulans. Okay. So this correlation between recombination rate and diversity across chromosomes uh, is a commonly observed thing. Um, a good observation of it is that uh, Corbett Detig et al. got a bunch of data, put it through the same pipeline, and, and in a sort of sophisticated way, calculated the, the correlation between genetic diversity and uh, recombination rate locally. So, this plot, each point is a correlation coefficient across a bunch of taxa, and, you know, almost all of them are significant, and, and you know, most of them are positive, but interestingly, not all of them. Okay, so um, this is, I think it's fair to say, what exactly is causing this is a big open question in the field, and, and answering it would tell us a lot about a lot of things. Um, <clears throat> then, so, okay. Before I go on, go on, I just want to fix ideas and notations. So I'm going to be talking about um, diversity measured by um, mean density of nucleotide differences from two chromosomes drawn from the same population, denoted pi, and divergence, denoted dxy, which is the same thing but mean density between um, chromosomes drawn from different populations. So the way to think about these is that pi is like mean time to common ancestor um, averaged across the bit of genome you're looking at uh, within, well, or DXY is between populations. Okay, so, um, so I said this is a big open question, but I think it's also fair to say that most people think it has something to do with link selection. Um, so link selection is the indirect effects of selection on bits of the genome that, you know, are nearby to the place where there's the polymorphism that that's actually being selected on, okay? Um, so for instance, if you have a beneficial mutation that pops up somewhere, then after it fixes nearby in the genome, you won't have much variation. And, you know, for harder to intuit reasons, the same thing happens in bits of the genome where there's lots of constraint, and so lots of deleterious mutations, uh, sorry, lots of mutations that appear there will be de deleterious. Okay, so um, <clears throat> what I'm gonna be talking about, I'm gonna be looking at a data set where we actually get to see sort of how these curves change over time. And so first I wanna set up the um, expectations for, for set, set up what we should expect. So I've sort of made some cartoons of this. Um, so <clears throat> suppose you got two populations and they split, okay? And then we're gonna be looking at, if you look at diversity in each of the populations and divergence between them, like what that looks like relative to locations of the genome where selection is acting. So if you just got a neutral bit of the genome, then as time goes on, diversity in both the populations should stay about the same if their sizes stay the same and everything. But uh, divergence between them should go up, because remember, it's just time to common ancestor. And uh, divergence between them is time back to the split plus time to common ancestor, so diversity within the ancestor. OK. Uh, now, if you got a beneficial mutation in one of the populations, that's going to reduce diversity in that one, but leave divergence between the two unchanged. Um, and of course, if it's soft sweep, it might not have a strong effect. Um, but if the mutations can move between populations, that'll have a more complicated effect. So, you know, the sweep might reduce diversity right around the, the, the selected mutation, but increase it sort of on the shoulders as you've got these diverged haplotypes moving between populations. So that, 
unlike before the sole effect divergence between the populations too because of introgression. Um, if your selected alleles, if, if selection goes the other way, so introgressed alleles are selected against instead of for, you'll have sort of the opposite thing happening, right? Because you get gene flow away from the selected site, but not at it. Um, background selection will reduce diversity, as we said before, and also reduce divergence, right? Because divergence is time to the split plus diversity in the ancestor. And if background selection has been going on also in the ancestor, diversity in the ancestor will look just like diversity today. So the red curve is just the black one sort of moved up. Um, recurrent sweeps will probably look similar for the same reason. Uh, you know, so here, just to reiterate, that dip in divergence is because sweeps that happened in the ancestral population reduce diversity there. Uh, if you have recurrent introgression, it seems like kind of anything can happen. Um, and okay, I think I've gone through enough situations by now. Um, so I went to look at some actual data where we can maybe see this. So, so uh, the data I'm going to look at, that we are going to look at, is from this species complex. So this is the bush monkey flower, the Mimulus orentiacus species complex. Um, and we're going to, so this is eight closely related species in one sort of outgroup. It's like a million and a half years back to the outgroup Clevelandii. Um, and all these taxa will, you know, interbreed with each other if you, you know, try to cross them in the lab, but maybe reluctantly. And on the left is something about their ranges. So some of them live nearby to each other and some of them don't. OK, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at sort of landscapes of diversity and divergence within and between these taxa. And, and by doing comparisons across you know, more distant taxa, we can get a sense of how these curves change over time. So, oh, and what I'm talking about is described in this paper with these wonderful people. Um, Sean Stankowski and Madeline Chase did a lot of the work, um, directed by Matt Streisfeld, and Alison Putin did the um, annotation. And, and they're lots of fun. Okay. Uh, so the data we have is a chromosome level assembly, which is awesome. Um, pretty good coverage, uh, like three or four individuals per taxa. Um, then we've got diversity and divergence in between all, you know, nine choose two comparisons in windows along the um, genome, and we have estimates of recombination rate and gene density. Okay, so um, let's look at what the data look like. So first thing we see is that, you know, like I said, that most taxa, like we see in most taxa, um, diversity, which is on the top, is correlated with uh, positively with gene density and negatively with recombination rate. Sorry, the other way around, right? I say it backwards. But anyway, so this is, these are two typical chromosomes. The other, ten, the other eight chromosomes look about the same, but kind of in the middle, you've got more diversity. So on the top, I've got nine curves, one from each taxon of uh, mean density of nucleotide differences in windows along the genome. The blue curve is the average. Um, and so higher genetic diversity in the middle, and in the middle you see on the bottom recombination rate. So higher recombination rate in the middle, and also fewer genes, which is the second one up. And the third one is a sort of local similarity of the tree you'd get by building a tree in that bit of the genome compared to the species tree. OK. Um, so the first thing we might want to look at is you know, how those uh, diversity curves change over time. So here I am showing you um, on the right, the plot, each point of the plot is correlation coefficient um, between a, you know, between the, the, the curves of diversity along the genome of one pair of those taxa. So the y-axis is the correlation and the x-axis is the genetic distance. So what that's showing you is that more closely related taxa have more similar landscapes of diversity, which is good. So there's phylogenetic signal here. 
Um, <clears throat> and uh, the next thing I want to do is, is look at um, divergence, right? So, um, you know, ideally we would um, have maybe landscapes of diversity from various points along this tree through time. We don't have that. We have to sort of look across increasingly distant comparisons. And, and also, maybe it would be nice to have divergence from each taxon back to the ancestor, but we don't. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to show you those landscapes of divergence uh, but grouped, you know, starting with closely related ones and looking at more distant ones. And um, just a sec, let me um, remind you of this model. So um, <clears throat> if, if you assume that the way that this species group has evolved is really by a strict species tree without introgression, okay? Um, sorry, I wish I had a pointer. But um, think about looking at divergence between that red one up on top and the red one down on the bottom, okay? So as I said before, that's going to be uh, time back to the split plus diversity in the common ancestor, which is, uh, you know, whatever change So that should be the same as divergence between the yellow one, which is right below that red one on top, and the red one on the bottom, because they both, you know, that the, their common ancestor population is the same, okay? And it's the same time back to that split, okay? So under that simple model anyways of no gene flow after speciation or whatever, then that's what we would expect. And so I'm gonna show you curves of divergences grouped by which common ancestor in that tree they come through, okay. Um, okay, so here, uh, all the gray curves are all the, diver all the divergences, don't worry about that, and the dotted curves are diversity within each taxon. And I'm just gonna show you through chromosome three, but they, they all look like this. So the red line is, um, is the, divergence in windows along the genome of these two very closely related taxa down on the bottom. Okay, the red one and the one above it. And you see that looks pretty much like diversity within taxa, so comparing two chromosomes from the same taxon looks about the same as one chromosome from each. This is good, like we expect. And if I look at the other pair of sister taxa, you know, the other two just above it, uh, it looks about the same. Moving up to the next point on the tree, so here I'm comparing the two texts on the bottom to the two above that, so I've got four curves here. Um, we see, uh, and, and I'm coloring them by, you know, which of one of the comparisons it is, uh, but don't worry about that for a minute. We just see that, okay, they're shifted up a little bit relative to these and are more or less on top of each other. And I as I move up the tree, the curves sort of move up. Okay, so that's the first observation. Um, I guess the first observation is that all these curves are, look very similar. The next observation is that as you go up the tree, they move up uh, and flatten out. And the other observation is that, well, I said that if this was like a strict model of splitting, for instance, all those curves should be right on top of each other, and they aren't. So in this case, this is saying that um, comparisons of the red one on top the top to all five of those taxa down the bottom, you know, the red one on top is a little bit closer to all those other ones than is its sister tax on the yellow one. So that says that there was like introgression after they split or like population structure in the ancestor, which is like the same thing. So something somewhat more complicated than a, just a species tree. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so that's, and here's all the data all at once, just so you can see what it looks like. Um, so what this is leading to is, uh, just look at all these. Um, <clears throat> so what this is leading to is, is as time goes on, so the x-axis is average divergence between taxa, sort of as, as, as a proxy for distance in time between the two texts that we're comparing. And the y-axis of all these things is correlation coefficients between various things. So 
FS, on the top we have FST and uh, divergence. And you see that sort of is a decreasing function, um, which makes sense because FST is just a function of, uh, sorry, FST and diversity. FST is just a function of diversity. FST and gene count. Um, but let's just look at this one down on the bottom. So this is divergence and diversity starts out highly correlated and goes down to zero as, as these curves sort of flatten out. Um, okay. Okay. Um, great. So um, here are our observations. So um, we said that the, uh, the different curves, landscapes of divergence that all go back to the same common ancestor population are similar, but not exactly the same. Um, and so this suggests that there's some early introgression going on, but it's not ongoing, right? So if, if we had, uh, you know, suppose there had been really recent introgression from, you know, the taxon on top to some taxon down in bottom, on the bottom that really sort of breaks this tree structure that would have showed up as, as like uh, uh, one of these curves separated away from all the rest. Okay. So we have sort of um, the relationship between these taxa is, you know, a lot like a tree, but not entirely. Okay, um, the next observation is that, um, you know, first divergence is just like diversity, but shifted up a bit. That's good, but then it starts to flatten out, and that's the really interesting thing about these data. Uh, the only, the, the two explanations I can think of that are consistent with everything else is that positive selection in the gene-rich regions on the end is increasing fixation rate sufficiently to make divergence go up faster in those regions. This would be very surprising, I think, because it would mean a lot of positive selection. Um, the other explanation is, um, you know, we have been pretty careful about bioinformatics and everything, but I'm still kind of paranoid there is something strange about repeats, of which there are more in the middle. Um, so this is possibly very interesting. Um, okay, so it, I think I have lots of time still. Yeah. Okay, um, great. So. Um, I have time to talk about the second thing. This is great. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the next thing I want to talk about uh, rather quickly is, um, is motivated by um, the previous one in, in that, like, you know, one interpretation of, this, of these data is that, well, maybe there's, like, quite a lot of selection going on. Um, and, you know, when the discussion around lots of selection starts to happen, uh, you know, a big sort of gap is our under, uh, explicit models, so our understanding of like, well, what's plausible and what do we expect to actually happen? So, so this project I want to tell you about is, um, I think, a nice, you know, fits in the middle in between. Uh, it's something that's sort of analytically tractable and also maybe starts to be realistic. And, and it's in this paper, and it's with Josh Schiffman, uh, who's now a postdoc at the New York Genome Center. All right, so, <clears throat> so imagine that, so we're thinking about modeling a regulatory network. And in this model, um, over the lifetime or you know, a year or something of an organism at time t, uh, we're modeling kappa t, which is the, a vector of expression levels. And um, the expression levels affect the phenotype. Uh, you know, the phenotype, sorry, is determined by the expression levels, but it's not all of them. That's going to be phi of t. And the expression levels, you know, they regulate each other, but they're also affected by some external input, and that's going to be u here. Okay. Um, and our model for how this evolves, sorry, for not how this evolves, but for how the organism lives is on the right there. It's just a linear system of differential equations. So um, got that uh, phi, the phenotype, is just a linear combination of some of the, the expression levels. 
mediated by this matrix C. And um, the rate of change of expression levels is a linear function of the expression levels themselves and the, the external environment, the input. Okay, so probably you just want to pay attention to A, which is the matrix of interactions. So if that's big and if AIJ is big and positive, it means that gene I upregulates gene J. Okay, so uh, this is a nice tractable. All right, and, and then, then we imagine that the coefficients of A and B and C are determined somehow by the bits of the genome, and we want to think about how they evolve uh, under selection. Okay, so um, this is a nice analytically tractable um, model to work with because you can just write down the solution to this. So um, the solution to this equation here is that the phenotype is going to be the convolution of the input with what's called with H here, which is the transfer function, okay, just because this is linear. Okay, so if you give me the input as a function of time, I can tell you what the output, the phenotype is as a function of time. It just gets put through this sort of black box of the transfer function. Okay, so, um, so if we're going to uh, ask how about this evolves, like, you know, arguably the first question we should ask is, you know, is, uh, you know, we want a, a system that does a particular thing that takes input and turns it into appropriate output. So the first question is maybe, well, how many ways are there to do that? Are there degrees of freedom? Okay, so, uh, you know, suppose you've got one system given by these matrices and, and are there other systems? Can I like turn some knobs in, in that model and, and have the same input output behavior? And the answer is yes, generically, there's lots of degrees of freedom. So this, there's, this is explicitly worked out in what's called the Kalman decomposition. And it says that generically there's, in something like this, there's lots of ways you can continuously uh, adjust the entries of these three matrices and have exactly the same system, exactly the same input-output relationships. Um, quick example, here's a very s simple system that produces, an, sorry, that uh, produces oscillations. And it turns out that even this simple system has a degree of freedom. So you can't make an oscillator with less than two genes. But it turns out there's still one knob you can turn and have exactly the same behavior of the system. Um, so you, know, you, you have to adjust more than one entry of A at once. But this means that um, there's that there's a degree of freedom. So there's neutral directions in, in this system here. Um, and of course, if I start adding more genes to this, you know, here is an example of a three gene oscillatory system that, that does exactly the same thing as the previous one. Okay, so, um, so what this is telling us is that, um, you know, we're imagining, we're, we're doing this cartoon model that, that the, you know, variants in the genome somehow are, are, are encoding the uh, regulatory coefficients in this matrix, and we're approximating the actual dynamics by this linear system, and I'm telling you that, all right, uh, what the math is telling us is that there should be lots of ways that we can adjust things and, and not change the dynamics of the system very much, and therefore, you know, um, these are these are neutral directions. Okay, so the um, a cartoon of this is just look on the left here. I'm drawing you a fitness landscape, and so I'm telling you that there should be a ridge in the fitness landscape. So the axis axes of this are um, you know cartoon entries or you know directions in um, the space of regulatory interactions, and uh, the dark black line is the optimum, and then it fitness goes down on either side. And so if you have a population in here somewhere, it should sort of drift back and forth along this ridge, maybe as long as it's you know, not too steep and, and, and things like that. OK, so, so if you've got a population that's drifting along this ridge for a while, well, if you've got two of them, eventually they'll drift apart. So that's what you got here. Two populations have drifted apart. 
And then if they start to interbreed again, um, there, there'll be incompatibilities, right? This is maybe not at first obvious because um, you know, each population um, has sort of different copies of this matrix A and both of them do the same thing. So maybe when you like average them, it will also do the same thing and that turns out not to be the case. Well, actually, sorry, if you average them, that's like an F1 and that's the red dots, it will probably more or less do the same thing. But once you start to uh, recombine entries between them, so look at the F2s, then you'll start to get systems that don't work. So cartoon picture of this here, but I'm happy to talk about it more. Um, <clears throat> okay, and um, so, so that's it. Uh, the conclusion that I have, the, the, the most surprising conclusion that we've got from thinking about that model is that just you know, purely, I guess not neutral, just a, a um, population, populations evolving under stabilizing selection should drift around on this ridge at speed proportional to uh, you know, one on NE or the genetic variance over NE. Um, right, that's quantitative genetics. Uh, which tells us that you should start to get in incompatibilities arising on a time scale of, I guess that, that should be NE over V, right? So on a time scale of any generations. Um, and then I'd like to say that uh, now I've put this together in a model with the, the mimulus, but I haven't done that yet, but it's the sort of thing I'm interested in doing. So um, thanks to you for listening and to my collaborators and funding and things.